two things we see there in that is that all that this world and this religious world, because he was sitting there where all of the religious folks were coming in, all that they have to offer anyone is just alms, just alms. Those things that would somehow maybe sustain this life for a little while. That's all you'll get in the world. And then when Peter and John came by, that reveals what we have if we will just look to Christ. Because he's the only one that can give us anything that is very, that is really significant to us. The world can only give out alms. The religious world can only give you alms or things that may help you in this life to just have your needs met. But Christ can give you life. He can give you complete life. And that's what they were revealing here in this miracle. And then as they came together and Peter began to preach the message similar to what he had preached on the day of Pentecost. He took them first to God the Father. He wanted them to understand that everything comes from Him. It's about Him. He was the one that sent Jesus, whom they rejected. He was the true Messiah that came from God, the Holy Son of God. They denied Him, and He died through their uh, uh, crucifixion that they had calls to happen and then God raised him from the dead and it was this man that they had crucified, died and rose from the dead that had caused this man to be healed and he's showing them that Jesus was indeed the true Messiah. He preaches the gospel, the first uh, of the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then he brings them to the place and he offers them repentance. And there he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now he's saying the whole thing, all that has been done, and all that God is doing and what he did through Jesus by sending him is to bring folks to repentance. That's the purpose of Jesus coming. So he brings them to that place and asks them to repent. And then after that, he reveals to them what is going to happen later with Jesus as he comes again. Now, repentance is the whole thing that God has been doing, trying to bring Israel to that place of repentance all down through history. Now, we must understand that God has a covenant with Israel. He made that covenant in Abraham. That covenant has never been dissolved or done away with because God's covenants are everlasting. And that covenant relationship that he has with Israel will continue and it will come to completion when Jesus one day reigns as their king for a thousand years. This covenant is still in place today. So we can't, we, we, we can't somehow reject that or neglect that because God has a special place for the Jews. And here, this is what Peter is preaching. He's preaching to the Jews, to Israel. This message is not out to the Gentile church because this message is to the Jews. Jesus said he came to his own. And he also said that this gospel was to the Jew first and then to the Greeks. It was offered to Israel first. Now, down through history, when the scriptures here said that all the prophets from Samuel on have talked about this thing that's going to occur one day. Samuel being the last of the judges and the first of the prophets and all the ones from him 
they spoke of the time that Jesus would come and he would rule over the nation Israel. There would be a restoration of the nation of Israel. And that's what Peter is showing them here. Now we know, we know that all through history, from the time that God brought his people into the land and gave them the land, and then they turned from him and began to follow other gods and walk in disobedience to him. And because of that, God has called them back to repentance all down through history. All the old prophets were sent to show Israel their sin and to bring them to repentance. When uh, there was no results at that time, then Jesus came and John the Baptist came out and his message was repentance. And there again they were offered repentance with no results. And then Jesus even preached repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was offering this repentance to the nation Israel that if they would repent, he would usher in the kingdom at that time. And they refused. And then we see now after Jesus has died and has been buried and rose again, now Peter comes out preaching the same message. Because what he is trying to get across to the Jew is that until you repent, God will not bring his kingdom to earth until there is repentance of the nation of Israel. That's what it's about. And that's what he says here in verse 19. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Your sins must be blotted out. We know how that happens through the blood of Christ when we receive him. When the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The time of refreshing, cool rest, and, and a refreshing time is what that word means. And that's what was offered here. Because if they would repent, then the Holy Spirit would come in and refresh them and give them a new life that they could begin enjoying the presence and the blessings of God. Because that's what he said. The refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Him being in you, with you, that will give you this refreshment that you need. And then he goes on now and begins to talk about what's going to happen. He said in verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Now this is going to happen one day. Whom the heaven re must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Christ is going to remain in heaven until the time for him to return and to restore everything back to its original state. This is something that we must understand what God is going to do. And there's going to be the nation Israel that will be restored to the nation that God will have and Christ will rule over them through God's chosen people. There will be the restoration of the earth back to its original state in the Garden of Eden. And then there will be the church who was a mystery that was hidden, that was not a part of the revelation of the Old Testament because it only revealed Israel. But the church who Paul revealed, that group, that is the church, will then become rule and will rule and reign with Christ because we will be the bride of Christ during that time. So what he's saying is that Christ is now in heaven. He's preaching that to them. But he's going to one day come and restore all things. If you look over in Romans chapter 8, we know that that's a good scripture in Romans chapter 8. 
to reveal that things one day are going to be back as they once were. And let's look at verse maybe 22 first. Because here he says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Creation, all of creation, everything that God has created, nature is groaning and travailing in pain until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to win the redemption of the body. He's saying that everything in the universe is groaning and groaning, wanting to be delivered and restored back to its original. Our bodies also, he included that because we are groaning, waiting till we can be redeemed in our body as well as our spirit and be like Christ. This is going to happen one day. And then he went on to say in Romans 8, and I'm not going to deal with that because that's a whole other message, that the reason that God chose us is to conform us to the image of His dear Son, that we will be like Jesus and we will honor and glorify Him throughout eternity. He talks about that. So he's telling us here in Romans that there will be a day when all of creation will be restored back to its original state. What did he say when he created the earth? Every day at the end of the day of the creation for that day, it said God looked at it and behold, it was good. It was good. And every day what he created was good. And after he finished creation of the six days, he looked at it and it was all good. Because it was created in a perfect state as God intended it to be. And then there was man created. Man was given the opportunity to be obedient. And when man failed to be obedient and committed the one thing that God had required him not to do, then that threw all of creation that God had created into a chaotic state. And now creation is not in a perfect state like it would have been had there not been a fall. And that must be restored. There must be a time when God <laughs> brings everything back to its original state. And that's what he's talking about, the restoration of all things. Not only <coughs> of creation, the earth, and all of the vegetation, all of the animal kingdom, and everything, but then also the nation of Israel, whom he chose in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to be his chosen people. They too will be restored back to the nation that Jesus will rule over. So what's this going to be like? Well, let's look over in Isaiah chapter 11 and look at the verse there. Because the Old Testament is full of prophecies dealing with this time of restoration. In Isaiah chapter 11, look at verses 6. Look at verses 6 through 10. Look at what he says. Here he's telling us how it's going to be after the curse is lifted and uh, uh, the, the uh, creation is restored. The wolf also shall dwell with the lion. Now we know today that couldn't happen. If you put a wolf and a lamb in the same pen, the lamb's not going to be there long. The wolf's going to have it in his stomach. Because creation, when the curse occurred, Creation went into a state of the survival of the fittest. And, and we saw the animal kingdom then turn and begin to devour other animals. Now it wasn't that way before the fall. Everything.
everything was in harmony. Everything worked in harmony. There was no hurt. There was nothing that hurt anything else. There would have been no killing of anything. There would have been uh, uh, no animal slain had the curse not occurred. And now here he says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. A leopard lying down with a goat, a young goat. Now we know that couldn't happen today because the nature of these animals that was changed in the fall is such that they would not allow that. There's, <laughs> there, there, there's all of that conflict between. Now look at it. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Man, this is what it will be like in the restoration. A little child can go out and lead a lion around. And that lion will absolutely not do anything to harm that child. Because there will be nothing in the nature of anything that will be harmful to anything else. Now that's God's perfect world. That's what it'll be like during this time of restoration. Now let's look on. See what it said in verse 7 here. And the cow and the bear shall feed their that shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. See that nature of the Animals that now are meat-eating animals will be changed and they will become vegetarians. Just like everything. The cow and the bear, they will graze together in the field. Their young ones will lie down together. And the lion, when you see him, he'll be out with the ox eating straw eating grass instead of killing and eating meat. And look at verse 8. And the suckling child, the nursing child, shall play on the hole of an asp. That's the word for cobra. Now you know you wouldn't allow your child to get around a cobra today because a cobra is a very deadly snake. But in that day, in that day, a little child, a nursing child, just a small child, can sit on the den of a cobra and play with that snake and not be harmed. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. Now that's the word for the vipers, the vipers, those deadly serpents. He can just put his hand right in that. There'll be no harm. They shall not hurt. Look at verse 9. This is the whole key. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, when the knowledge of the Lord, when everybody is operating under that kind of rule, the knowledge of the Lord, Everybody will be in harmony. There will be nothing out of place when that happens. Now this is what Peter's talking about when all things are restored back as they should be. Now let's look over to Isaiah chapter 35. Because again, Isaiah gives a lot of prophecy concerning this day. Isaiah chapter 35 and let's look at verse 1. And here he said, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the road. So he talked about the animal kingdom there in chapter 11 of Isaiah. Now he's talking about the <coughs> vegetable kingdom <coughs> and how it's going to be during this time. The desert shall rejoice. There be no more barren places because he said it shall blossom as the rose. Look at verse 2. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall 
See the glory of the Lord and the excellency of God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and conform the feeble knees. Say to them that are of fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with the recompense. He will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass and reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring man, who food shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found therein, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and singing shall flee away. That's the restoration. That's this day that Peter is talking about that's coming. Everything be back in order. One place the Bible says that the sower will overtake the reapers. That the crops will be growing so fast that they just reap one crop and sow another. That the blooming of the desert will be so plentiful that it will just blossom again. Can you imagine the land without the curse? No, we can't imagine that because we, we, we don't have anything to compare that to. But without the curse, everything will grow to its fullest. There will be nothing to hinder it, nothing to uh, stun it, nothing that will keep it from producing to its fullness. I can't imagine seeing a fruit tree that produces without the curse what kind of fruit it must produce. And vegetables that grow without the curse what kind of quality they are. And if you think you've ever had anything good quality vegetable fruit today. You just wait till that day. You ain't never tasted nothing like that. Or saw anything like that. And all things be in harmony. Nothing out of kelter. Nothing out of place. Now why is this time coming? Because God said I've got to bring back everything to its original state. And because I made a covenant with Israel, I will bring them back and rule over them. I have made a covenant. Now, if we were to look in Romans chapter 11 and verse number 1, you'll find a clear statement that God is not through with His people. Romans chapter 11 verse 1, Paul said, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What you not what the scriptures said of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, the Lord, they have killed the prophets and digged down thy altars, and I am left alone. And then, of course, God answered it, and he said, I have 7,000, haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And he goes on to say, there is a remnant now of the elect. There is a remnant God has of Israel. And one day, he's going to restore the nation. When is that going to happen? restoration of the nation will be brought during the tribulation period. You see, Peter and all the prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus, now Peter, has been preaching for Israel as a nation to repent. They never repented. There's a number of people come to faith in Christ during Peter's preaching and his ministry here in the early church. But not nothing compared to the whole nation and the rulers and all of those that were in 
the place of leadership in the nation never repented. But that day will come. That day will come when they will repent. Go to Zechariah. Zechariah, next to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Look at verse number 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourner <coughs> for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadaraman in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn, every family apart, the family of the house of David apart from their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart, Family of Shema apart and their wives apart. All the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. And then verse 1 of 13, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. Here is when Jesus returns, reveals himself unto his people, and they are going to receive the one that they rejected here in this message that John is talking about. They're going to receive it then. What has brought them to repentance? You see, that's the thing that we need to understand. Although all of this, if we look at it from man's perspective without God's sovereignty, we see that God has tried to get a nation to repent so he can become their king. And then we see that all down through these times, they still reject Christ. And what was the purpose of their rejection of Christ? You can read in Romans where the Bible said that blindness in part had happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile be coming. God had in His plan because we can't understand God. We see it as would have been had Israel accepted Him. But then when we look at it from God's plan, they did not accept Him so we could be brought in. Had they all accepted Him, we would have been lost without any hope. But God intended this from the beginning. So He has allowed Israel to reject him that the Gentile may be brought in and the church may be born. And the church was the mystery in the Old Testament that was revealed in the New Testament by Paul. And the church saints, God is building his church today. And here's what happened. I don't have time to go into a deep prophetic message because one thing, when you get into prophecy, there's no way to get out. It <laughs> just keep going. You, you have to keep dealing with it. You have to understand God's clock. God's clock don't run as our clock runs. God had a clock that he started run ticking in the during the time that Nehemiah had come back to, and made the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. God started a time clock right then. And that clock was revealed in the book of Daniel. Daniel called it 70 weeks of time. These 70 weeks, which, which uh, each day was, was a year, 70 weeks was 490 years. Now, what happened? God started a clock because God's clock deals with the nation Israel and only runs when that nation is in view. God's clock started when the decree was made to rebuild Jerusalem after they'd been carried away captive and then there was a decree with a king 
decisions made that they could rebuild Jerusalem the wall. Now, there was 69 weeks of that 70 weeks that ran just, just uh, ran right in time. And then at the end of 69 weeks, which was 483 years, God stopped that clock. Why did he stop the clock? Because the clock started with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And then the clock stopped when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday and they rejected him for the last time and they were cut off. And then the clock stopped because now Israel has been cut off and set aside and God's getting ready to bring in the Gentiles. The clock stopped with one week left, seven years left. And now, God's clock will start again when the church is called home and Israel is brought back in view. At the beginning of the tribulation period, God's clock will start running again because now the Jew is back in view. And what's going to happen immediately after the rapture? When the Antichrist comes to power, and guess what's going to happen immediately? God is going to seal 144,000 Jewish preachers to preach through the tribulation period. You're going to have the seal of God on them. 12,000 from every tribe. We talk about the lost tribes of Israel today. And of course, nobody can determine where the uh, lost ten, only tribes where the tribe of Judah was kind of ones that brought back and started. We say the lost, there ain't none of them lost for God. God knows where all of them are, and God's going to seal 12,000 out of each tribe. And they're going to preach this gospel. They're going to preach the gospel throughout the tribulation period. And Israel is now going to because the tribulation is to bring Israel to repentance. That's what it's for. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. And it will be that it will, that will cause them to repent when God calls them back to himself and they recognize who he is. In Revelation 7, if you want to read about the ceiling of the 144,000, you can read it there. And also, during this time, there's going to be an angel fly through heaven with the gospel preaching. There are going to be the two witnesses that come preaching the gospel, Elijah and Moses. And it's going to be a horrible time because there's going to be such persecution and such attacks against the nation Israel and against anyone that would confess Christ that it's going to be a horrible day. But there's one thing that's going to happen in the tribulation period. The greatest revival, the greatest movement of souls coming to know Christ is going to happen during the tribulation period. Because you're going to see when the church leaves, when the church leaves, and the restraining force that the church is today in the world is the restraining force a whole bag of evil. When that is gone, God's going to allow the evil to take over because the Antichrist is going to come to power. Now let me just make a statement here. President Obama is not the Antichrist. <laughs> now we have a lot of fools make all kinds of statements. No one of the church looks like a bunch of idiots. Uh -huh. President Obama is not the Antichrist. And there have been folks trying to say who the Antichrist was for years. I remember back many, many years ago when they would make statements, so-and-so is the Antichrist. Well, none of them were. And here's the thing about it. Nobody knows who the Antichrist is, nor will they know till he comes to power. God doesn't reveal that. But during that time, 
There's going to be the greatest evangelistic movement and people coming to Christ that's ever been. Because we see in the book of the Revelation when John looked and he said, Who is this great number? This multitude from every nation standing here with their robes wide and been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And he said, Though these are they that came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes wide in the blood of the Lamb. So God's not true. There's going to be another movement. And I believe that all those that have heard the gospel in this age that have really heard the gospel and, and know the gospel and have been exposed to the gospel, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians that they will receive the lie, they will believe the lie and be damned because they did not receive the truth. But there's multitudes that haven't heard the gospel that in the tribulation will respond and come forth. So what's happening? The restoration. God is bringing Israel through this time, this trouble of the tribulation to bring them to repentance and they will repent. And at the end of the tribulation, Jesus will step out of heaven and come back to earth and set his feet on the same place he left, the Mount of Olives. And there he will bring his people under the rock there will be the judgment of the nation of Israel. And they will go in to the kingdom. There will also be the Gentile nation. Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations. Those that have helped Israel during the tribulation that reveals they are believers. All those believers that came through the tribulation also will be judged. That's when there will be the division of the sheep and the goats. And the sheep will go into the kingdom. The goats will perish and then there will be the setting up of the kingdom when Jesus himself rules from Jerusalem as king for a thousand years and the curse is lifted and all that has been messed up by sin is restored back to its original state and we will see this whole earth just like Adam saw it in the Garden of Eden during that time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Precious, precious time. Now, we could go on and talk about Revelation 5 when Jesus takes the scroll and opens the seal because he's the only one worthy. That's the title deed of the earth. But here, John is saying to Israel, He's saying that there's going to be this day of restitution or restoration. That's what the word means. And this is what has been spoken by all the prophets down through the years. It even goes back to Moses. It talks about the prophecies that he made that Jesus would come one like him. And he's saying this one. He said, that, he said, you shall hear him all things, and whosoever, whatsoever he, he shall say unto you. And then he goes on in verse 23 there, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So there's the rejection of those that reject Christ. Now, so what John is doing in this message is telling them that the one that they crucified was the Messiah. If they had repented and accepted him, he would have ushered in this restoration at that time. But now, because of their rejection, he has been sent back to heaven, and he will remain there until the time of restoration. And we don't know when that is. There's one other verse I want to look at in Luke chapter 21. And verse 24. And uh, uh, you know, we need to do it. A, uh, I guess a series of messages on prophecy. Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. 
and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And that day will end when Jesus comes again. Now, when we look at the condition of everything today, and we look at those that have no desire and no concern about the things of God. We're looking at folks just like Israel was here to this day. But he's coming. He's coming. And John is telling them there that this day is going to come. Paul, in his writings to Rome, Romans 9, 10, and 11 have to do with Israel. It's just like he puts a parenthesis in his book on Romans and deals with the nation Israel in these three chapters. And we know that God made a covenant with them that will be fulfilled and that God will bring back everything that was lost in Adam will be brought back by the second Adam restored through him. He is the one that paid the price that is the Redeemer. That's why in Revelation 5 when John said, I looked and there was the whole host of people and they were weeping because there was a scroll that no one could open. And they searched, they couldn't find anybody worthy to open that scroll. Then he said, I saw one rise up, the line of the tribe of Judah, the one with the nail prints that he had been slain, and the evidence of his crucifixion. And he said, he took that scroll, he took that scroll, and he began to open it because he was worthy. Why? paid the debt to redeem what Adam lost in the beginning. He was owner as the title deed of the earth that's grown. And he has the right to do with it whatever he chooses. He owns it because he created it. And then it fell into a cursed state. And then he redeemed it back by his own blood. So he owns it doubly. And he takes the scroll and he opens all the things in the scroll until all of the plagues and everything that occurs in the revelation has occurred. And then he comes again and sets up his kingdom and restores everything back to its original state. Peter said he's going to remain in heaven until the time of restoration of all things. And he's coming. Stand. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have promised us as well as you promised the nation Israel that they would one day, one day be restored. Lord, the promises you've given to us as the church or that you will take us home one day and we will become your bride. We will rule and reign with you during this time. Now, Father, I pray as we go about our business every day that we will keep in our mind that we are just waiting on the redemption of our bodies. We will one day be like you bodies as well as our spirits. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Let us shine this week. Let us reach someone with the gospel. Bring us in contact with someone that we can share with. We'll give you the praise because you're worthy.